Um, thank you very much for being here with us tonight, for joining us, joining us for this event. Um, my name is Soheila Komninos. I work for Op Open Society's Human Rights Initiative program, and I will be the moderator for uh, tonight's event. Um, the event is organized jointly by the Human Rights Initiative and Open Society's Global Drug Policy Program. Um, and here I will give special thanks to Diego uh, Garcia Davis, who um, is the one who actually came up with the idea for, for this event. Um, our programs both fund um, and support civil society organizations that challenge the um, excessive use of incarceration globally, um, including for women who are incarcerated for drug-related offenses, communities of color and other marginalized communities. And we also support organizations that um, advocate for uh, progressive drug policy. And some of these organizations that work at the intersection of these issues are represented uh, by our guests tonight. Before we start the panel discussion um, with our three guests, um, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Kasia Malinowska, who's the uh, head of Open Society's Global Drug Policy Program. And then we'll launch into the panel discussion. Um, I will ask you to save questions for the end. Uh, we'll have a um, Q&A uh, session after the panel discussion. And also so that you know there is uh, food and drinks outside of these doors and there will be time to um, mingle and network at the end of the, uh, the event. Uh, so please uh, stay for that as well. So now I'll give the floor to, to Kasha. Thank you. Thank you, Sohaila, very much uh, for welcome, uh, welcome, welcoming us all here. Um, my name is Kasia Malinowska and I direct the Drug Policy Program but there are many, many of us here who work on drugs uh, at OSF, and um, and so it's a pleasure to see colleagues and, and our guests and, and all of you. Um, I wanted to, uh, yeah. So so let me let me just maybe start by saying that when when my adventure with drugs began uh, about 20 years ago. Um, uh, w uh, the set of countries that I visited um, then were Central Asia. And so as many of you know, Central Asia sits on a border with Afghanistan. So uh, drug issues became a major sort of problem and, and as former so Soviet, as Soviet Union fell apart um, and as money stopped, sort of pension money, um, it started flowing and salaries stopped flowing from, uh, from Russia, from Moscow, um, the issues of poverty became really dramatic. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, all those, uh, all those countries sort of needed to shift. Um, and, um, and many jobs were lost, uh, many men left um, actually for Russia to, as migrant workers. And uh, drug trafficking became, sort of not surprisingly, became a way um, to secure uh, economic um, means for, for many uh, families um, and many women who were left behind. So actually, in, uh, during my trip in, uh, to Kazakhstan, I met with the Ministry of uh, Interior, with the Minister of Interior, who with incredible pride in his voice, uh, told me that one of their sort of drug control accomplishments at that time was opening a women, women's only colony, um, a sort of a Soviet version of a prison, um, and that he gave me, I don't remember the numbers, but they were impressive of women that were there um, from very young women. I think the oldest uh, detainee was around 75. And again, he said that with pride in his voice. Um, and he presented it as an accomplishment. And so I started to ask, you know, so who are these women who are locked up for drug trafficking? And what are they spending their money on? And he explained that men are gone, that you know, if you work in, uh, if you live in high mountains, there really aren't that many options. Um, and that women are 
using that money to pay for books for their children. Um, and so as you can imagine, that conversation just became increasingly more difficult. Um, but I am struck by how those stories sort of come back again and again and again, regardless of where, where I go. One of the most recent trips that I made were actually with my uh, colleague Diego, who was mentioned earlier. Uh, we were in uh, Guaviare in uh, Colombia. And again, we went to prison and we saw we met up with a woman whose children were sort of out and about and she had no idea what is happening with them. Single mom, uh, unclear how long she's going to stay in prison. Um, for what? For tiny amounts of coca paste, which really was about sort of assuring likely, a livelihood for herself and her children. So it's striking to me how that story gets repeated um, and how economic um, hardship drives, uh, drives crimes related to drugs. Um, so it really is an honor to, to uh, say hello to you all, to welcome you all. Again, thank you for your work. Thank you for, um, for speaking and bringing this issue to light. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that we do talk about it and that we do uh, share stories uh, of, uh, of those women, but and more, more maybe equally importantly talk about the structural um, uh, inequalities that are driving those experiences um, and making them only worse. So again, thank you for being here. Welcome to OSF. I hope you stay after and and we'll have an opportunity for a conversation um, over to our esteemed panel. Thank you, Kasha. So we're going to um, move on to our panel discussion. Um, I think you have the biographies of our guests, but on my left is uh, Andrea James, who's the um, founder and director of the National Council for um, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls in the United States. Then we have Coletta Youngers, who is the expert at um, the Washington Office on Latin America on women, drug policy, and incarceration. And finally, Anna Pekova, who is the director of um, Equis para Mujeres, which is a, hum a women's rights organization um, from Mexico. So to start the discussion, um, I will um, start by asking Coletta if you can tell us a, a little bit about why it is relevant to talk about incarceration across the Americas. Um, I'm thinking about how the United States is um, in a league of its own as the, the country with the highest incarceration rate in the world, a system of mass incarceration. Um, what are the trends um, across the, the continent that um, show similarities and, and differences between the United States and other parts of the continent? Um, good evening. And uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you to OSF, uh, to Diego Sohela, Sohela Kasha in particular for um, giving us this forum. Uh, I'm thrilled to see so many people who are in this room. I've become very passionate about this subject, and I'm so happy that other people share that passion that I have. Um, so let me start by talking about some of the, you know, sort of the overall trends and, and the similarities that you've asked about. I think there are more similarities than differences between women incarcerated in Latin America and in the United States. And what we find um, in our work, uh, our research and our advocacy work, is that women's incarceration goes hand in hand with social exclusion, poverty, and gender-based violence. Um, uh, I think in general in Latin America, if you look at um, the women who are deprived of liberty, the vast, vast majority come from situations of extreme poverty, uh, they different situations of vulnerability, little schooling. For example, in Colombia, 76% of incarcerated women uh, have not completed secondary school, very few economic op opportunities, and often getting involved in the drug trade becomes a way of putting food on the table for their kids. Um, we also see across the Americas um, patterns of uh, women having suffered from discrimination and violence. Most women have suffered some form of sexual domestic violence before they get into the criminal justice system, and then, of course, while in the criminal justice system. 
Uh, many have mental health issues that may be linked to drug dependency. Uh, a surprising number uh, have dependents, or mothers. And um, one thing that really struck me when we first started working on this issue in Latin America is the astounding number of women who are single mothers, um, up to 90% of uh, women incarcerated for drug offenses in some cases. Around the world, we see that these women uh, commit nonviolent crimes in general. Um, homicides are often linked to more violent crimes, such as homicides are often linked to abuse. The, a large percentage are first-time offenders, and there are lower rates of recidivism than men when they get out of prison. And the driving force behind these rates of incarceration of women, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, are, um, are harsh and disproportionate drug laws. We've exported the, the drug laws that you hear about here every day to Latin America, and they have been applied there in ways that are often um, sort of cr even cruder uh, uh, ways of doing it. So, for example, we find in a lot of Latin American countries, any drug offense might be a sentence from 12 to 25 years. So we meet people in prison who've been selling drugs on the streets who have a higher sentence than somebody who's committed murder. Um, and we also see a disproportionate uh, way in which that is applied to men and women. So in our research, what we've seen is that in general, men may be, um, might be 20, 25, up to 30% of the male prison population is there for, for drug offenses. But when you look at women, it's 35, 50, 70, and we've even found cases where 80% of incarcerated women are there for drug offenses. Brazil, Chile, um, Panama, Costa Rica, just to name a few, over 50% of women who are incarcerated are there because of, of, of drug offenses. In the US, that number is closer to 25%, so that is, uh, I think, an important difference. Um, in Latin America, we find that 95% uh, are for, that's their first offense, it's the first time they have entered the criminal justice system, and these women operate at the lowest level of the drug business. They're usually involved in um, street-level dealing, uh, transporting drugs within the country or across borders, uh, cultivating crops that are used to produce um, cocaine and, and heroin. And in general, these women are at the, um, they're, they're, they're the ones who are the easiest to replace. They're expendable, for lack of a better word. So one day they're picked up, and the next day somebody else has taken their place. This puts absolute, makes absolutely no dent in the drug trade. And we often find that law enforcement efforts target those who are most vulnerable. Um, so women are in these positions where they are, are more vulnerable than certainly the people who are, are making all the profits. And, um, hence tend to be uh, arrested more frequently, which may be one of the factors that explains uh, why, why there are so many more women than men proportionally in, in jail. Um, I want to make very clear that um, I'm not trying, this is basically the profile that we see of these women. I do not want to in any way uh, present these women as victims. I think on the contrary, these women are agents of change and, and um, I, through the work with Andrea and others, have just learned a tremendous amount from people who, who have been formerly incarcerated. And I think we really need to avoid that, you know, sort of portraying them as, as victims. Um, and so one other question I'd like to address is, is why are we focused on women? Um, and to begin with, I want to say that, you know, for WOLA, you know, we start, this project grew out of a, a bigger project on criminal justice reform and, and reforming drug policy in Latin America. We want men and women to not go to jail for drug offenses. Um, but what we see is that there is a disproportionate impact on women. Um, if you look worldwide between 2000 and 2017, the number of men incarcerated around the world increased 19%. Well, for women, that figure was 53%. Women are being incarcerated at an astounding rate. Um, and that's particularly high in Latin America compared to other parts the, of the world. And I think we also have to recognize that women face, as I alluded to before, uh, multiple forms of discrimination uh, once they are brought into the criminal justice system. Prisons are not built to suit their needs. Um, there is greater stigma, stigma excuse me, for women than for men, particularly if you've committed a drug offense. So often women, and I'm speaking here because Latin America is, of course, my experience. You know, if you're a woman and you are um, put, in, put in prison for a drug offense, often the, your family doesn't want to have anything to do with you. And they don't want to take your kids. Um, and as I said before, a lot of, a lot of uh, these women are mothers. They are single mo moms. And it's a huge drama for them what to do with their children. If a man is incarcerated, 
um, the, his mother, his you know, sister, his partner will help out with the kids, but that is not always the case for women. And I think that the society uh, judges women more harshly because they are seen as having defied their, um, the traditional roles that are ass assigned to them as caregivers. So we meet women who, you know, in their sentencing, the judge says, you've done all this harm to your kids. And that woman will say to me, I was just trying to feed my kids. Um, I was not trying to harm them. So we really have to take that into account. Um, and, you know, basically, it, it, the, the situation has a devastating impact on women, their kids, their families, and their communities. And it perpetuates vicious cycles of poverty and exclusion. So I just want to end by, um, uh, and I haven't been paying attention to you on the time, but <laughs> I'll end here. Okay. You know, I think it's just so important that laws and policies take into account the conditions often of greater vulnerability of indigenous women, of Afro-descendant women, of the LGBTI community, of pregnant women, nursing mothers, um, as well as women living in poverty. And that's not something that is normally talked about in policy making circles. And more broadly than that, we believe that no woman should go to jail for a drug offense, um, particularly a nonviolent drug offense. So we need to dramatically reduce the number of women in prison. We need to provide alternatives to incarceration. And most importantly, we need to think about this before this whole vicious cycle gets, gets moving. We need to empower women and give them the skills and the resources that they need to live lives with dignity. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Coletta. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my earpiece. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask uh, Andrea to turn our attention you know, to the U.S. context and particularly as a formerly incarcerated woman yourself, you've been really advocating for the empowerment of formerly incarcerated women. And um, I would like to ask you to um, clar you know, elaborate on why is this so important that formerly incarcerated women and girls are able to self-advocate in their own name. Well, thank you, and I want to also thank uh, OSF, and um, I also want to thank WOLA. I started doing uh, work outside of the United States about four years ago with Coletta, um, and it's been an incredible experience and has expanded our work and helped us to understand that the issue of incarceration of women and girls is global and that we need to address this, as Angela Davis has been teaching us forever, that we have to start, begin to recognize this as a global issue. And there's nothing more apparent than when we travel and meet with Anna and meet with the sisters in Mexico and in Argentina and uh, Brazil and some of the other countries that we've been to and are going to, that this issue is, um, these issues are the same for uh, the women who are entangled in the criminal legal systems in their country. Um, and, um, our, our, uh, the National Council actually was a proposal here that, that started at, at OSF as a um, Soros Justice Fellowship proposal. As we came out of federal prison and we were desperate to stay connected and to keep the organizing that we had started inside of the federal prison, you know, um, the, this whole idea of having a National Council uh, was given life um, here in, in, uh, at OSF. And so I, I just think. Um, I, I'm thankful for that, and thank you, Mary, also for the support that you've continued to provide for us to learn more. And um, I have a lot of mentors in this room. Uh, Kathy Boudin is here. Um, Kathy Boudin is a lifeline for me. Um, this work is very difficult um, I, in, in, in so many ways. Um, but to have formerly incarcerated women who are so brilliant, like Vivian Nixon and Kathy Boudin and the sisters from the National Council, Anissa and Jan, and, and all of the folks that have come out tonight to be a part of this with me, and mostly Nana Roz. Nana Roz, when we came home, we literally stood on the corner and sold dishcloths to get gas money, and a lot of times we got stuck. We didn't have any money to get from wherever we were, and I just wanted to acknowledge the, some folks that really gave us a lot of support in the very beginning and continue to do that. And Nana Ross was one of those people who made sure that she came and found us and put gas in the car and whatever else. <laughs> um, but um, this is a really important issue of why we need to um, find ways to have our voices heard. And I'm going to go straight to the point. We just came out of the um, 
um, passing of a piece of legislation in this country um, referred to as the First Step Act that is being touted as one of the best pieces of criminal justice reform ever in history. And the National Council um, did, for the entire 2018 year, we did nothing but listen. We went from small kitchen tables in Lower Alabama, in Appalachia, in California, in Arizona, in Boston, Massachusetts. We went around kitchen tables and listened to uh, formerly incarcerated women. We went into prisons all across this country and we spoke with currently incarcerated women and girls. We um, then moved up to larger listening sessions. We had convenings all across this country and we brought women together to have these conversations. And then we ended our listening um, year in 2018 with a town hall meeting that we held in 20 communities across the country at the same time at the, on the same day. And we took all of this incredible information from women in prison, in the federal prisons, in the state prisons, in county jails, from women sitting in their living rooms and at their kitchen tables, from women in all of these convenings. And we brought all this information together and we looked at it. And we said, what are, what are, what are these women saying that they need? And not one bit of what was in the First Step Act that's being touted now as this incredible piece of criminal justice reform, not any of it was what the women and girls who are most directly affected. And women, even prior to our uptick in the numbers of women going to prison, women have held and carried the burden and the difficulty of families who have been directly affected uh, of, by mass incarceration forever. Okay, And so they've been entangled in the criminal legal system in one way or another for a really long time even prior to them becoming directly um, dragged in and incarcerated themselves. And so I think that they're experts. I think that it's clear that they understand what's needed um, and that um, it's important that we listen to them. And when we also now have public opinion, which is something that we work on, um, we, we have an outrageous goal. Our goal is to end incarceration of women and girls. And people kind of look at us and say, what? Uh, you, you mean you just want to reduce it? No, we want to end it, and we mean it. Um, and we feel as though having done deep, deep research and looking at who are in prison, going to prisons, having lived in prisons ourselves, we are absolutely certain that we know better ways of, of doing this uh, that don't involve prisons. Um, and um, we're um, intent on getting that done. We may not know how to define that clearly, clearly yet, but we're beginning to take the steps to figure it out. And one of them, again, was this listening tour that we took. And then we culminated, all, we brought all this stuff together, and we created a campaign that we've just launched with 20 fellows um, uh, called Reimagining Communities. And um, it's our way of saying we don't want to try and reconfigure a prison anymore. We don't want to put our energy and ask the universe to concentrate and all the people who are supporting change to focus on prisons anymore. We want to focus on reimagining our communities because we feel as if we do that and we begin to implement the things that we're envisioning, we can make the, the current system obsolete. But it's clearly, as we have seen from the First Step Act, it is not going to come from that. That is so far removed from what people who are struggling, who are so just, um, their lives have been so incredibly disrupted from this onslaught of incarceration and carceral tools and carceral thinking, and also what the First Step Act is now ushering in. The First Step Act has now opened the door for more digital incarceration, for more e-carceration, for more um, uh, ankle shackles, what people refer to as electronic monitoring. We refer to them as what they are. They're ankle shackles. Um, and um, we're very, very, very concerned about that. And the fact that not one piece of that legislation included what the uh, women and girls from the communities most directly affected were asking for. And so our goal in creating Reimagining Communities is to do just that, continue to do the work. We started, we're determined to, to begin to empower ourselves as we sat 
as so many women before us did, as Vivian did, and as Kathy Boudin and Cheryl Wilkins did sitting in the New York State prison system and demanding that women be educated, um, we were determined in the federal prison to, um, in 2010, when there was this uptick in conversation around uh, ending mass incarceration, we didn't hear one word. We were 2,000 women crammed into this prison in Danbury, Connecticut. We didn't hear one word about us, our gender specific needs and concerns. We didn't hear anything about our children um, and the effect that incarceration was having on our children and the communities that we left behind. And so we sat around that picnic table that, that hot day in the summer in the prison yard and we said, we're gonna do this and we don't know how we're gonna do it, but we're just gonna start doing it. And we did. And we're here today still after a whole lot of very difficult challenges. We're still here and we're building and reimagining communities is our way of saying, here is what we want, and we are going to start in very hyper-local spaces within our communities. We used to call this a couple of years ago when we first were thinking about this, before we kind of had all of the listening and all of the visioning kind of mapped out, we called it block by block. And now we call it reimagining communities, and we don't necessarily call it block by block, but the, the idea is still there, that we need to start in just very, very, very hyper-local spaces and support the women in implementing those projects that, and campaigns that they have included in their vision for their communities, and then to work our way out from there. And that includes everything that you can imagine, um, including um, things that intersect, such as housing and entrepreneurial training and cooperative business opportunities. We did a deep dive in studying um, the work of Jessica Gordon Nembrand and how historically for African American communities, cooperative businesses have been the things to um, uplift um, communities that were uh, marginalized from, from cash flows. So we're, we've taken all of these pieces and created this project called, this campaign called Reimagining Communities, starting with our 20 fellows and doing deep, deep work in the 20 communities around the country that they're coming from and really not spending a lot of our energy any longer on going to a system now that we're clear still thinks that the only thing that needs to change is the indictment on the person who's already in the prison because that's what the First Step Act is. It's a continual indictment of the people who have already been incarcerated, found guilty, incarcerated, and put into prison. And you're still told that the, the, the system is only going to recognize that you need to be made better. And um, yeah, and yeah. so I'm going to stop you here, and I'm sure there will be questions on um, on US. Yeah, I probably open a whole can and, of worms uh, with that, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to uh, give a chance to um, to Anna to um, tell us a bit more about um, her organization, and particularly, um, Ekis is a feminist organization. There is strong stigma, as um, both of you alluded to, on, um, against women who are incarcerated um, in, uh, in Mexico. And I think it would be interesting to hear from you why did Equis get engaged in this, um, in this conversation and um, uh, to tell us uh, a bit about your, your activities. And I think um, if you could link that to the, the new government in, uh, in Mexico, what are the opportunities and challenges with um, um, Manuel Obrador's uh, government. Yeah, thank you, Sahela. Uh, being the right, is it on? Yeah, yeah, yes. it's on. You can hear me. Being the last speaker is always complicated, and going after Andrea James is even more difficult. Uh, so, feminism and incarcerated women. I keep on telling Sahela, no, that's a very difficult question, and I wish I had the uh, complete answer to that. Um, uh, anyhow, um, X is a feminist organization, and we work to promote, to guarantee um, access to justice. And first of all, for us, access to justice is a universal right that belongs to all women, and that obviously includes uh, women who are in conflict with the law. Uh, what we do is we work to demonstrate how uh, gender is a factor uh, that determines access to rights, access to opportunities, uh, challenges. In other words, how it determines uh, uh, your place in the world, you know, whether you're a man or a woman. Um, the feminist movement has traditionally focused on uh, some issues uh, where gender differences are very notorious, very obvious. 
uh, such as domestic violence or sexual violence, both of which are phenomenon uh, that uh, predominantly affect uh, women. Um, women who have suffered violence, they have been uh, traditionally denied access to services, access to treatment, and the feminist movement, I think, has rightly focused on uh, that. However, over the last decade in Mexico, we have had another uh, phenomenon, um, which is the war on drugs, where uh, gender dimension is perhaps less visible. Uh, nonetheless, the impact on women has been huge. Uh, for one, just I want to share with you that um, women, uh, typically, the type of violence that women suffer in Mexico has completely changed as a result of the war on drugs. Traditionally, women have suffered uh, or they have been more at risk of violence in their homes, uh, in the private sphere. However, starting from 2009, when this war on drugs started, uh, women uh, began to get killed more in the public space. Uh, there are other affectations too, but I want to focus on the one that's topic uh, of today's discussion, uh, and that has to do with uh, the huge increase in the number of women who get incarcerated, uh, where drug-related crimes are the number one cause, uh, at least on federal level, for incarceration of women in Mexico. Um, so uh, women are still a minority in the Mexican uh, criminal uh, system, uh, penitentiary system, sorry. However, the rate of their incarceration grows much faster than the rate of uh, men. I often get, get asked why, uh, and uh, I think the answer to that is rather complex. There are several reasons for that. Uh, first of all, it is very important to understand that there is uh, um, very, very big, very important persecution of uh, these sort of activities. Uh, it is also true, as Cassia was uh, mentioning, uh, that discrimination and poverty drive more and more women to get engaged in this sort of activities uh, every day. Uh, however, also it has to do with uh, the way in which the Mexican um, legal system works. We've got authorities who have no capacity whatsoever to dismantle complex uh, organized crime networks, which are often transnational. Uh, the only uh, uh, criminal activities that get captured uh, and absorbed within the system are those that are um, captured like red-handed, you know, like uh, in flag flagrants? Flagrant, yes, in flagrant. Um, and, and women who normally, who traditionally get engaged uh, as drug traffickers, they're the easiest victim for this. They just intercept a bus that's traveling from the state of Chiapas to Mexico City. They just search it and there is always a couple of women to take uh, with them. Uh, now, Coletta spoke, I think, a lot about the differentiated impact that uh, drug policies had on uh, the di differentiated impact of incarceration on women. Uh, and gender is a factor that determines uh, how women and why women get engaged in this sort of activities, uh, how their experiences in prison, but also the challenges relating to life after prison. I think they differ for men um, and women. Um, and uh, there are two more things I'd like to add to this. Uh, one, that the impact is different for different women. Women are not all a uniform category. Intersectionality is very important to take into consideration in, in this analysis. Um, and the other one, something that's been documented in Mexico by uh, um, an academic, Catalina Perez Correa, uh, is that uh, women are not affected only when they themselves are incarcerated, but also when they've got a family member that enters prison. Uh, women in Mexico, and I guess it's the same here and in, in, in the United States, uh, they basically sustain the whole uh, prison system. They're the ones who need to work to provide money and resources for the person that's inside. Uh, they take care of, of the children and all the family from the outside. They go to visits, and it's actually quite impressive to see how long the lines are uh, of women that are waiting uh, to visit uh, in front of male prisons, while in women prisons there's only there's there's very few uh, visitors. Um, so to sum up, for us, Adekis, uh, uh, feminism is about dismantling um, uh, structural inequalities, the inequalities that exist uh, among men and women, uh, and prison is no doubt a place where um, that is a. Uh, is, is a result of, and it aggravates this inequality. So uh, not only it is relevant for feminist organizations to uh, turn to women in prison, but I think we do not have an excuse uh, for not not doing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, right. And you like... wanted to, the, the new government, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> uh, right, so um, 
as I was saying, the costs of the war on drugs have been incredibly high uh, for us in Mexico. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the war has not only been unsuccessful in limiting access to drugs, uh, but it has also led to a huge to a context of uh, uh, human rights violations and huge insecurity. Just over the last ten years, we've had uh, uh, over two hundred and sixty-seven thousand violent deaths. Uh, nearly 34,000 uh, disappeared people. Um, and the toll has been particularly high on communities such as uh, migrants or uh, indigenous people, women themselves. Uh, women are a uh, few of those who have been victims, for example, of uh, forced disappearances. However, nine out of 10 people who are searching for the disappeared ones are, uh, again, women because of uh, gender roles. Uh, so it was really a, a breath of fresh air when, during the campaigns uh, last year, uh, um, around July, uh, the winning candidate, Lopez Obrador, uh, started talking about um, uh, the, the failure of the strategy of militarization, uh, about the criminalization of poverty, about the need of, for communities to take up a greater role. Um, and uh, uh, there was a very specific interest to begin liberating, for example, growers uh, of, uh, um, in rural communities, then indigenous women who are in prison for drug-related crimes, but whose uh, processes were seriously uh, violated. Um, and it is in this context that we saw a major opportunity to uh, push for change. So we've basically begin working with WOLA uh, and with participation of women who are in, pri who are in prison and uh, formerly incarcerated women. And we drafted a proposal uh, uh, for amnesty, asking for amnesty and liberation of all women who are in prison for drug-related crimes. Um, and uh, basically, uh, if approved, we believe that this could be a very uh, important recognition of the failure of the current, uh, uh, current policy and it could hopefully open up the door for uh, liberation of women who are in prison for other crimes and, and men too. Uh, it's not gonna be easy. Um, I think stigma is very real um, and it is an issue. Uh, we've developed uh, and we're working on a communications campaign to sort of address this, uh, this issue. Uh, however, some of the challenges come from the context itself and I think they're even more complex than, uh, than stigma itself, but I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. I could take it up a little bit later. Yes, if I'm, yeah. yes okay. later and maybe with the, the questions yes. from the audience. Uh, we were actually going to show you a short film um, produced by um, Ekis and Wola, which um, features a few stories from um, incarcerated women. Um, it's in Spanish and uh, subtitled. It's seven minutes. Uh, so I think we, uh, we are going to show it now, and you can see it on the screens around the room. Yo ya tenía 12 años, luego yo iba a pedir dinero prestado. Préstenos 100 pesos, préstenos 200 pesos para comprarnos comida. Entonces llegó un día que yo me topé con, un, con una persona de ahí mismo del pueblo y le dije que si nos podía prestar dinero. Y me dijo que, que debíamos de ganar el pan para salir adelante. Entonces me dijo, yo te ofrezco un trabajo. Te ofrezco a que me acompañes, vayamos a, a México. Tú vas a cargar un paquetito que yo te voy a dar y yo te voy a dar dinero a cambio de eso. Yo cumplí 20 años el 15 de abril. En agosto me fui con el primero que se me atravesó. Era un señor casado. ¿Y qué hicieron mis padres? Porque el Señor dijo que era casado, no se podía casar conmigo. Pidió dinero. Todavía me vendieron. Y en ese tiempo, 10 mil pesos agarraron cuando yo tenía 20 años. Porque yo salí señorita y me vendieron. Lo del tráfico cuando me separé del papá de mis hijos. 
porque este, una mujer sola con dos hijos, aparte de que tenía un trabajo estable, pero no ganaba lo suficiente para mantener dos niños, mantenerme a mí, a mis papás y a un hermano. Pues, conocí amigos, de esos amigos me llevaron otros amigos, amigos y así me, me fui metiendo más y más y más hasta hacerme yo mi negocio propio. Siempre se escuchaba que ya empezaban a sembrar marihuana. Pues el pueblo siempre mmm, vendía o cultivaba. Y lo que sí veía que las familias este, decían, la llegué a conocer, la marihuana, por lo mismo que las familias la siembran. Y oía que expresaba que cuando había mucha demanda, trabajan las familias, trabajan los niños porque es un medio, eh, sobre todo, para, económico para los pueblos. Estuve trabajando como, como un año en, en una tienda de, de cosas para mujeres. Ahí este, conocí a una persona que fue mi pareja sentimental, por así decir, como por dos meses. Este, pues empezamos a andar. Yo también no tenía la mayoría de edad. Este, me convenció y yo llegué a mi casa y le dije, ¿saben qué? Ya no quiero estar aquí, me quiero ir con esta persona. Y me fui. Pero empezó a haber un problema. Él era muy celoso. Entonces hubo un día en que llegó así de la nada al, al, a la casa donde vivíamos y me pegó horrible, 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 horrible. Lo peor que se pueda imaginar. Me pegó y me dijo que, que no, que yo no iba a jugar con él, que que cómo se llama que yo no iba a hablar ya con nadie más de mi familia, que iba a ser estrictamente cuando él quisiera. Había, había momentos en los que él quería tener que mirar conmigo y yo no quería y prácticamente pues me violaba, ¿no? Entonces, este, empezaban a ser muy, muy constantes sus celos. Este, incluso de las veces que me pegó en una ocasión me rompió una costilla porque un día él llegó y me puso una pistola en mi cabeza y me dijo que, que esa era la última vez que él iba a pelear conmigo que para la próxima ya no iba a haber golpes ni malas palabras, simplemente pues él iba a tirar de la pistola, ¿no? Ser mamá en la cárcel es una situación muy difícil, muy triste. Es vivir preocupada por los hijos, pasar las noches en velas a ver si están bien, si no han pasado frío, si ya comieron, qué sentimientos tienen, este, abrazarlos. Y nosotras como personas indígenas, nosotros no vivimos, cuando estamos en casa no dormimos separados de los hijos. Los días que vienen son horarios limitados y en el caso de la chiquita ella de plano no quiere estar aquí. Ella empezó a llorar mucho, empezó a hacer perrinches, empezó a enfermar. Ya no quería estar quieta, se salía para la puerta. Ella no puede estar aquí porque sufre. Ah, mi hijo sí sabe, es el más grande, él tiene 11 años. Y sé que a él no le da pena que su madre esté aquí. Él le da mucho gusto tener una madre que nunca lo ha dejado solo. Que siempre ha estado con él. Porque, porque son mis hijos, nunca los dejaría. Porque los amo y los quiero mucho. Y dice ella que no, no puede defenderme en la apelación porque para poder defender a, al Señor tras y ya con el nombre de Él, tuvo que culparme a mí. Tuvo que, que culparme a mí para poderlo sacar a Él. él me, como Él me decía cuando hablábamos por teléfono en, que estaba Él también detenido, no, dice, si yo logro salir, yo la voy a ayudar. Yo voy a ver por los, por los chamacos, la voy a apoyar a usted. Y pues, a veces, nosotros creemos en eso. Hasta aquí, ya el tiempo que llevo, ya el más del año que salió, Y pues no, no ha podido venir hasta aquí con mis hijos. Y eso es lo que yo a veces digo. 
o a veces pienso también de que igual y no he hecho ni el mínimo esfuerzo como para poder venir hasta aquí aunque lo que yo más deseo ver es uno de mis hijos So I hope that you, you all managed to, um, to understand the, the stories of these women who are really um, moving and, and sad. And an immediate question would be, so what are um, organizations like uh, yours doing about, uh, about this? But I think, Coletta, you just wanted to say, OK. No, no, I'll do it when I talk next time. Right, so, um, so we've been working for a while now on uh, Documenting. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I turned it off. Okay. Um, thank you. So we've been working for a while now on documenting uh, the negative impact that uh, the drug policies have had uh, on women, um, and based on that, we have uh, uh, designed and carried out um, uh, an extensive advocacy work too. We also provide uh, legal aid and representation, uh, in fact, to one of the women who appeared there. Uh, uh, we choose basically uh, like emblematic cases which could lead the way uh, and help liberate an additional number of um, women. Um, however, in all of this, uh, one of the most important lessons, um, I guess, uh, it has been that we cannot and, and we must not move uh, forward without uh, the voices of the women who have been directly um, affected by these policies. Um, so uh, in addition to uh, uh, these sort of uh, materials, we've also uh, began uh, to work on creating spaces uh, for formerly incarcerated women uh, from Mexico uh, and family members of incarcerated people to come together, uh, to hold dialogue, to begin working towards uh, an agenda. Um, Andrea, we've been very lucky to have uh, Andrea and her colleagues from the council you know, practically every year over the last couple of years uh, uh, in Mexico and to share with women from Mexico their, exper their experience. Uh, unfortunately, the levels of organizing are uh, um, still quite low and not as good as in the United States, but uh, um, we are working. Um, and uh, we are there to uh, provide any support that we can to this uh, movement. Um, in fact, we recently organized um, a regional dialogue um, that uh, included women from Canada, from the United States and Mexico, formerly incarcerated women. Um, and, and, and it was amazing, you know, like Coletta was saying, beyond the cultural, linguistic, political or other differences, it was the similarities that uh, dominated and women were very, very clear. They were anonymous. Uh, uh, there is a big question, you know, about uh, what gets punished and, and who gets punished. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if Coletta wants Thank to add you. something. Yes, I think um, if you want to, to add something about um, this action and, uh, and the movie and, um, and maybe just to complement um, what um, Anna was explaining about, you know, her goals, uh, advocacy goals in Mexico with what WOLA is doing at the regional level as well. Sure, um, and I'll get in a little bit to talking a little more about why we produce this video and, and what we're doing with it. It fits very much into the work that Equis is, is doing. So, so WOLA basically, we work in, partner, in partnerships with groups in the region, um, and um, we work with our partners on this project to seek to reform criminal justice, drug policies by changing the narrative and by doing advocacy at the national, regional, regional and international level together. Um, the, th this project got started um, some years ago when I was involved in another research project that was really the first effort to document how uh, drug laws was the cause, the primary cause of, the, of Latin America's prison crisis. You know, people would talk about it anecdotally, but there was no study, no research that actually showed that. So we, we produced a report called Sistema Sobre uh, uh, Systems Overload. 
Um, and in the course of that, I started looking at the data and realized what I mentioned previously, you know, like, whoa, in this prison, 25, in the, for men, it's 25%, for women, it's 70% in this country who are incarcerated for drug charges. So out of that, we decided to um, bring people together to start thinking about, well, what can we do to address this? So we formed a working group uh, of, that's now about 25 people around the region, mostly women, some men. Um, and it really ended up, it, we didn't go into it thinking we were going to do it this way, but it ended up being this really interesting combination of people who came from human rights groups, people who were drug policy experts, people working on drug policy reform, and people from feminist organizations. And for me, it was the first time I'd actually ever worked with feminist organizations, and I've learned a ton from Anna and, and a couple of the other women there. And I think that richness, that basically just gave our work a richness that we wouldn't have had otherwise if we had we not been able to bring these different groups of people together to work on this one issue. So the first thing that we did was we produced this policy guide. Um, it's a, a guide for policy reform in Latin America and the Caribbean. There are postcards out there somewhere if you, uh, that give you the link to download it that basically is a roadmap for policymakers that want to implement reforms in this area, who want to do gender mainstreaming and drug policy. Um, and, uh, and, and it's very much based on principles of public health, human rights, and gender. I won't go into a lot of, I mean, it covers seven different areas. For, for purposes of time, I'm not going to go into the def different recommendations. Um, but uh, a lot of it is, you know, decriminalizing and eliminating laws that don't need to be on the books related to drug policy, alternatives to incarceration, and ultimately, we want this new term that we coined, I think we coined it, I don't know, uh, <laughs> in the context of the campaign in Mexico, excarceración. Um, I don't know how you translate that into English. Decarceration, is that how you would say it? Yeah. But excarceración, we want to get these women out of jail. Um, but the other component of the project, which is related to this video, um, you know, so the, so the policy guide, you know, we've, we, we actually this ended up being a resolution uh, in the, that was adopted at the main UN drug policy making body, which is called the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. They actually did a resolution which mandates that all governments around the world mainstream gender into drug policy. Of course, they hard, of course hardly any of them have done it, but, um, but there is that mandate. Um, and we've been able to, to achieve some reforms in different countries, Costa Rica um, being the primary one, and that sort of thing. But the other component of it that's really important is changing the narrative. Because when you talk about women who are incarcerated for drug trafficking, people think they're criminals. They, they've, har they've harmed society. They've harmed their children. Um, they deserve to be there. They're that Reina del Pacifico, you know, the big, I think they might be a, 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 a series or whatever you call it now uh, about her, you know, the big, big drug, yeah, the, yeah, the queen of the south, the big, you know, the big drug lords uh, who are women. And that's not the reality, as we've described before. So we want, we wanted to provide opportunities for women to tell their own stories, to prevent their, present their own realities. And this um, makes a huge difference when you are talking to people and changing their opinions. Um, before we produced this video, we did a series of photo essays that we used in workshops with government officials in Latin America. And I've seen a room full of government officials where every single one of them was crying after seeing you know, one of the photo essays or, or more re recently with these videos that we filmed in Oaxaca. Um, this video was really um, uh, uh, the, the idea is to use it as, uh, as a way of sensitizing public opinion in Mexico and generating public support for the kind of <clears throat> initiatives that Anna was talking about in terms of our, our immediate campaign right now, which is to get all of these women out of jail. Um, in fact, uh, it has been viewed, not opened, but viewed 45,000 times. It was covered in all of the major, or many of the major newspapers uh, in Mexico, and it's, we're now using it in this new campaign. Um, so it's going to, you know, it'll have a lot more legs. We, we anticipate that it'll, there'll be a lot more views. There's two other videos, by the way, which you can also see on, on, on our webpage. Um, and just to uh, go in a slightly more detail to the campaign that Anna was talking about, what we're doing this time is a digital campaign. Well, has never done this before. We're so grateful that OSF has provided us the resources to do it. I'm not a communications person. I'm old, old school, so I don't understand all this stuff. But it's the ideas 
you know, that communications is moving much more in the direction of paid advertising, driving audiences to your message. So we've um, been able to contract with a PR firm, Aruba in Mexico, that is helping us design a campaign that we really hope will result in either an amnesty or pardon for all women who are incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses in Mexico. And then the third part of the, the third component of the work that Anna are also already talked about, so I'll be very brief, is really um, not only raising the voices of these women as we have you know, tried to do with the, with the videos and other things like that, um, but also really trying to provide spaces for these women to come together and to get them a seat at the table where policy decisions are being made. Um, there is nothing like the National Council in Latin America, as, as Anna said. Um, there, we don't even have many women who are willing to come out and speak, as Andrea or Kathy or other pe women in the room, room here would do, um, as uh, women who have been deprived of, of liberty. So what we're trying to do is take what lessons you know, have been learned from the National Council and, and create spaces for women to come together, um, both in solidarity, but also with an eye towards becoming more engaged in, in advocacy work. Um, and I've learned all this from, from Andrea, really. Um, it's not just raising their voices, but it's also making sure not only that women are, these women are participating in the debate, but that they are leading the debate. Um, so to, just to conclude, uh, this uh, uh, one of the big activities we have coming up this year is we're going to organize with uh, the support of OSF a regional workshop of formerly incarcerated women from the, across the Americas. That's um, going to happen in Colombia. We're doing it with a, um, uh, an organization called Corporación Humanas Colombia that will happen the middle of this year. And we're really excited. It's the first time that we've ever really been able to bring together this community uh, of people. The National Council will be presente. <laughs> um, so we're really excited about that. Yeah. And this is a really good transition to, um, to ask you, uh, Andrea, about your um um, you know, your impressions, uh, you, you both mentioned, Anna and Coletta, that um, Andrea traveled last year um, a few times to Latin America to meet with incarcerated women and formerly incarcerated women and their families. And um, you're really focusing on this in the U.S. Why is it so important that um, this um, effort of international solidarity and international spaces for uh, women from different countries to come together, um, why why is that so so important? Well, the um, when we um, when we visit um, the other countries and we have an opportunity to meet with and speak with our sisters in these places, it's just incredible because the stories are the same. Mm -hmm. And mostly when you feel the, the connection is when the sisters begin to have conversations about what it was like to be separated from their children and the pain of that. And that leads to conversations about the choices that um, women uh, made that landed them on a prison bunk. And those stories are the same. And so we're talking about living in capitalism. We're talking about living in systems that marginalize people. Um, we're talking about a world that still does not value and respect women. We're talking about all of these things, uh, uh, lack of access to education um, basic human rights that people have to food and shelter that don't exist, whether you're in Roxbury, Massachusetts, or in the favelas of Sao Paulo. Um, and it's important that we, one, because we are the National Council and we do um, convene ourselves and come together mostly because we just need to be together. It empowers us. If you've ever experienced a convening led by the National Council, it is something you will never forget. We do a conference every year called the Free Her Conference, and last year's conference was incredible. 
um, and that's hundreds and hundreds of formerly incarcerated women that come together. And we know from going to other places and convening with women and, and, and other women in other places that are in spaces where they're not as comfortable because of the stigma um, and the political ideology in different places are afraid to come together and do this work, we know that um, that, that has an impact on the sisters um, and we stay connected with them and we're struggling to figure out how to do that more. Um, but it's about empowering women, it's about empowering girls, but it's about empowering um, people across the globe uh, to begin to dismantle a system that is not um, equitable. And when you begin to approach it from that way, um, it involves a lot more than just us. But we know that we have a huge contribution that we can make as formerly incarcerated and currently incarcerated women and girls from our shared experience. And that we're not treating as a bad thing anymore. We're letting go of the stigma. We're letting go of the negative aspect of that. And we're looking at all of the incredible courage and strength and power um, that we find when we're together and that when we build together um, and using that to create some real meaningful change um, not just in this country, but um, um, in terms of, of just changes that need to be made, human, human rights changes that need to be changed around the globe. And I'll just end here. We're currently, um, with the help of Kathy Boudin and, and um, Coletta and Mary and OSF, we've been, and Anna, and all of these women that we've met in all of these different parts, are, we've, we've taken the... UN, our experience at the UN was we left there saying, this is the last time. <laughs> we are not going to be represented here. <laughs> but um, that was a great experience going to the UN, but still. Um, and we've broken down, we took all of the regions of the world that the UN has created. And we are building an international commission of uh, formerly incarcerated women. And we're reaching out to women. We started, of course, with the Americas, with the Latin, in Latin American countries, because that's who we were given access to, that Mary helped us, and Coletta and Anna helped to convene us in these places. But we have taken all of the regions of the United Nations and now are reaching out um, and with our advisory council, and Kathy Boudin is at the, are, you know, helping to advise us on this and speaking and finding women in Africa and Asia and all of the regions that the United Nations has broken this world down into. Mm -hmm. um, because um, these are issues that need to be addressed and we are experts in the area that we have an expertise in and we intend on being a part of creating um, significant change um, for many reasons, uh, fascism being one that is increasingly on the rise. And we feel as though we have a lot to contribute to, to turning that around. Thank you, Andrea. I think we will end our panel discussion on, the, on this note um, about this exciting cooperation between the, the three of you and uh, open up for questions and, and answers from the audience. I see several hands. So we don't have um, roaming mics. Uh, you will have to, um, to walk up to the mic here and take turns to, to um, give, say your, your question. And um, maybe we'll take four or five questions uh, at a time. Uh, please say your, your name and what organization you're affiliated, affiliated to, if any. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Um, good evening. My name is Lippy Roy. Uh, I'm an internal medicine and addiction medicine doctor in New York. Uh, I was also the former chief of addiction medicine at Riker, New York City jails, including Rikers. And prior to that, I was a primary care doctor at Boston's homeless uh, men and women. And throughout 
all of my years in caring for underserved men and women, certain themes were consistent, and I'm sure this will come as no surprise. By the way, before I go on, a profound gratitude to each of you for taking time and effort to speak and for the work that you do. We need to clone <laughs> all of you multiple times over. So, But some of the recurring themes, obviously, and particularly with the women that I saw at Rikers, 99% had some type of history of pain and trauma. But what we're trying to do now in addiction and it's similar to what you, the problems you're facing with in terms of women, incarcerated women, it's profound stigma and really trying to reduce stigma through education and, and correcting misinformation. Um, and we feel that, at least as a doctor who specializes in addiction, getting far more treatment, evidence-based treatment for, for people, men and women, but particularly women, I think that'll really, I think, reduce um, incarceration rates. and. Um, and help them while they're incarcerated too. So I guess one of my questions for you is, what other role do you see um, for the health professionals in uh, addressing the needs of women, which you all obviously identified are very unique, and jails, prisons are not designed to help pregnant women, um, women with various um, medical issues that are specific to them. Thank you very much. I think we'll take a few questions and then the panelists will answer. I, I recently read in the Wall Street Journal that 70% of all the men that are in prison have no fathers. I'm wondering, number one, if it's similar for women. And second, I have a girlfriend whose son on marijuana twice plowed into children, uh, plowed into cars in Westchester, by no means poor people. And third of all, my son, who's a PA in Portland, Oregon, tells me that because uh, of the drug situation, and when you allow health care for all, he said that they come in looking for anything that's a painkiller. They clog up the health care system. If you do not give them a painkiller, then they report you as being a bad doctor. And a lot of the doctors are afraid of being reported this way, so they give out painkillers, opioids, other things that they shouldn't be giving out. So I'm wondering how letting more people out on the streets is going to help the situation instead of just magnify it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Eva Rodrigo. I'm a researcher. I've been uh, doing field work in Peru for, se for several years. And one of the questions that I uh, ask uh, the, the, my um, the the, women, the incarcerated women was uh, where are the, your children and who is taking care of their children and uh, they said uh, they said I found that seven percent of them uh, responded that uh, they were living by themselves and you know I found no information about that uh, anywhere. Uh, no one is uh, paying attention to that, and uh, this is mainly because they don't want uh, their kids to be taken by children's services. And um, one of the women told me uh, that it was that she was uh, taking care um, uh, of them through the phone, you know, through calling every day. And um, another thing that I want to mention is that uh, that it doesn't happen in Peru, but it's very uh, uh, common here in the U.S. is the termination of parental rights. I mean, th this is, the family courts are so quick to end parental rights here. This is not uh, very common in the U.S. And that, that's it. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Karina Melnick, and I just want to reiterate, thank you so much um, for sharing your stories and for all that you do, because um, this is an issue that I personally have to admit, I was not fully aware of how bad it was until you know I heard you speak, so thank you. But one thing, one thought that I've been having is that it seems that a lot of people, a lot of these women who got involved in drug trafficking, they did so because they were in times of immense need. Uh, there was almost no other option that they saw, whether they were um, in incredibly deep poverty or they were just they were forced into the situation by a significant other. It seems that despite, you know, you know, even if this women were consulted beforehand or educated, this immense need f to feed their children would drive them ultimately to get into involved in the drug trade anyway. So I was wondering, like, I know a lot of you are doing work kind of post women's involvement in um, drug trafficking. So what maybe are your thoughts on preventative ways? Like, would it be education despite like there's still a chance that the women might um, get involved because of great need? Or is it decriminalization entirely? of drug trade, um, and in that case, would you believe that um, 
drug trade isn't all that bad. So yeah, so what are your thoughts on preventative ways? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. We'll take one last question and then you can attempt answers. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Karen Jamie. I was invited by Darlene Jackson. I'm very grateful to be here. I'm actually affiliated with our children and um, I, uh, I'm going to be giving some of my time to give some of my story to, uh, I think it's one of the organizations that she had asked me. But either way, I was just wondering about your background. Um, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Andrea. Andrea, I'm sorry. So I was wondering if you could give me a little input as to how you started with this organization and what, what how did it start with you, personal, um, the affiliation. That's it. Thank you. So I come from a family. Um, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope I can answer, I hope I'm answering what you're asking. I, I was born into social justice work. I come from a family of what we call um, educator activists. I come from a family of lawyers and doctors and educators who uh, were part of the civil rights movement, broke very many color barriers here as black people in this country. My grandmother broke a color barrier for nursing was one of the first black nurses in this country to break the color barrier. My uncle was the first black tenured law professor at UCLA. My aunt was the first black female lead pediatrician for LA County. My parents are both educator activists, still travel at 85 and 89, just returned from Cuba. We were born into this work. We were taught to address an injustice when we saw it. We were raised on the civil rights movement and we were educated to understand that we have a responsibility as African Americans and as Americans to address the injustices and inequities in this country. So that was my first introduction to this work. I grew up in a community of Roxbury, Massachusetts. And in Roxbury, Massachusetts, we are one of the, we are currently the most incarcerated community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts right now. It is a predominantly, when I was growing up, African-American community, cash poor and working class community, and uh, soon became um, just as much Latino community as African-American, which it is still today. And again, it was one of the most affected communities by the war on drugs. I had the privilege of attending some of the best schools throughout my life. I went to Milton Academy, which is a very elite private school throughout my childhood where I saw the difference of treatment of very wealthy white children who were just as addicted, doing all of the things that people who are addicted to drugs do, but they had all of the opportunities in the world to recover from that, to go away and to be held and taken care of and returned back to that school and to go on to Harvard and Yale and Princeton and all the wonderful places those of us who have privilege and education get to go to. So that was the other experience that I had that led me to this work. And by the time I was 13 years old, understood as the children in my community of Roxbury were going into juvenile pr prisons, and my friends who were at Milton Academy doing the exact same things had a very different trajectory planned for their lives. And then I became a criminal defense attorney. And I worked in the courts in my community and in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in the district courts and in Superior Court every single day. And I witnessed the just incredible brutality of a criminal legal system that churns predominantly black and brown people in and out of that system every single day. And so I cut my teeth at the public defender agency and then I went to uh, into private practice where I still um, continued every day to go into criminal court and defend clients. I also became a real estate conveyance attorney and I got in trouble as a real estate conveyance attorney and I was afraid to tell anybody. And that experience led me down a very slippery slope that led me to a prison bunk myself. I'm married to a man from Queens and Harlem who served a lot of his young baby, young boy years in Rikers Island. 
and then served a 10-year mandatory minimum federal drug sentence. There are very few people that have had the experience with this system that I have had and seen it from so many different lenses, through so many different lenses. And so that's where this work comes from. When I walked into the prison in Danbury, Connecticut, to serve a two-year federal prison sentence, I didn't think there was anything that anybody could tell me more about how much we need to work to change the system until I became an incarcerated woman. And I walked into that prison, and I knew exactly all of the lessons my grandparents and my parents and my family and my community had taught me because it was like looking through the roof of a slave ship. There were black and brown women stacked on top of each other everywhere we looked. And that shook me to my core. There were women who I had to survive getting through being away from my five-month-old baby boy and my 12-year-old baby girl, and I had to get through 24 months of being in that prison. I was in prison with women who were going on their 24th year and still weren't able to come home. They are still there. And so we began to work to create that change. And that's how I came into this work. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Coletta, would you like to, to take some I'd of the I'd tell you my personal story, but it's not nearly as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's hard to top that, and I'm going to be really brief um, because I know we have beer and wine waiting for us out here. But I want to recognize the other questions that were, were asked, so I'm going to go through them quickly. Um, we so need health professionals in this. In, you know, in Latin America, there is, I mean, if it's bad here, you can imagine how much worse it is there in terms of people either who have, um, you know, issues with drug dependency or mental health issues, you know, your access to treatment is, is virtually nil. Um, with regards to the second question, which is somewhat related to the fourth questions, if anybody else noted them by number as I did, you know, I don't, there's no doubt that drugs cause harms. Um, and there's also no doubt that present drug policies cause harms. One of the things I was trying to convey in my presentation before is that there are a whole lot of people who are in prison who are not a threat to society. And they're, they're, you know, their release is not going to increase crime and, and, and insecurity. But I very much recognize the fear that, that, that was expressed and in, in, in that so many people feel, fear, feel um, uh, when you talk about these complicated issues. And we see this in many neighborhoods in Latin America where you know, there is so much crime and violence and, and it's natural to be afraid. But I think what the you know, evidence that we're building is to show that you can have more effective and humane policies um, that will both be more beneficial to the people who are the, being harmed by the system and, and, and those, uh, those who are not in some way, I guess. Um, uh, and I think the other, you know, the other thing, you know, we could get into a discussion of legalization, but let's keep it to decriminalization. Nobody should go to jail for possessing drugs. Um, I just think that's crazy at so many levels. You know, if you have a drug dependency problem, you should have access to treatment if you would like to, to access that. If you are a recreational drug user, you do not belong in the criminal justice system. So simply starting with decriminalizing uh, possession and growing of drugs for personal use, I think would be a really good um, step forward. And there was one more question about kids. Mm -hmm. We have Lynn Paltrow in the audience. If anyone wants to ask her more questions about uh, pregnant uh, uh, women and mothers, um, but um, yeah, it's a huge issue. Thank you, Coletta. Anna, do you want? Anna. Uh, right. So there, were, there were so many questions, and they were all they were all different. Uh, your your, your mic, like, I think, um, is not on. <coughs> right. So I was saying that there were quite a few questions, and they were all different. Um, right. So the first one um, about stigma against women who are in prison. Um, I think that can be addressed by um, getting more information about the women, who are these women who are in prison. And I wanted to share with you something about an exercise we did in Mexico, which basically proved that the authorities have no idea who's in prison, who is among those, those walls. 
we began sending out a request for access to information to all the prisons in the country, asking how many of the women who are inside, I don't know, have uh, some sort of disability or uh, how many are LBT women or uh, indigenous women, uh, women with HIV. They had no idea. The answers were so ridiculous. It was so worrisome for us. Uh, and it's very difficult for me to see how we go about removing stigma without this information. They would answer that there were only five indigenous women in states predominantly inhabited by indigenous population. Uh, or they would tell us that um, LBT, that's not an information that they gather because they don't want to discriminate anyone. So for me, the question is, uh, if that's a factor, uh, you know, sexual... Um, uh, orientation is a factor of discrimination outside of prison, why wouldn't it be inside prison, you know, and by not asking that, you are discriminating. Um, so uh, the information is very relevant, not only for uh, to provide policies during their time in prison, but even more so when they leave prison, because the challenges relating to reentry would be uh, very, uh, very different. Um, I wanted to, uh, basically, my impression is that we are hiding in prisons what we don't want to see. Um, and that's why we keep on uh, ignoring it. Um, it is, uh, for me, everything about uh, uh, drug policies it's, um, uh, and drug use, it's, it's a public health issue. Um, and I think what we've seen and what we can be certain about is that mass incarceration is not a solution to the problem and that hasn't contributed to getting uh, nowhere, uh, nowhere better. Uh, for me, the most important thing is, um, and somebody asked about prevention, you know, where do we start? Uh, we've come to believe that uh, the criminal uh, justice system is a solution to everything, and it is not. Uh, and for me, one of the most important things is taking this issue out of the of the criminal system and, and starting to see the bigger picture and, and seeing the links with uh, education, with employment, with development, you know, uh, uh, the wider picture of, of discrimination. Thank you. I'm conscious of time, uh, so I think we might um, no, end the, <laughs> the Q and A's here. But we have until uh, we have the room until eight, uh, so we have a, a half hour to um, you know to mingle, and you'll be able to to talk to the speakers and enjoy the food that's just outside of the doors. And I think we can applaud our speakers. <laughs>